there is the argument that my data is my own, and when I do something on Facebook or on OkCupid or, or wherever, that that is an asset that I've created that I deserve to control, right? And of course, Facebook's argument, and obviously OkCupid's argument as well, what we're giving you in exchange for your data very clearly is these, the, are these tools. Like you, you on OkCupid, you can find dates. On Facebook, you can connect with long-lost friends. You have an easy platform to collect pictures. You dot, dot, dot. You know, to the extent that any of these sites are useful, that's why people use them. I mean, there's nobody that has to use Facebook or certainly OkCupid. There's plenty of alternatives for that. Um, people have argued that you should be able to get money in exchange for, for contributing your data to Facebook. If Facebook goes and sells the fact that you're into Ferraris or whatever to, to Ferrari, and so then you're therefore you see ads and are somehow incrementally more likely to buy a nice car, that you should somehow get money from that. But my argument there is that you're, what they're giving you in exchange for this information is the fact that you can use Facebook for free. You know, it's, it's not like a phone service where you used to have like a $50 phone bill or a $100 phone bill every month. You know, it's free. Um, however, I think there is a good argument for you being able to, re when you're tired of that exchange, I don't want to use Facebook anymore. You should be able to exit that experience wholly rather than leaving whatever vestige of yourself uh, you have to leave now. I, I know that they give you tools for that in the world, I think, generally is coming around to this idea, but it is scary even to me as an owner of one of these websites that you're going to sit there and live online, and if for whatever reason you want to break up with the site, um, that you're still beholden to them even after you've made that decision. Privacy historically has been a luxury of the rich in certain ways. Like I think I bring up these examples in the book, but you know, it, you want to have a private car and a train. You want to have a house with walls or a house with a big yard and walls. Um, you want to live in some remote stretch out in Woodstock or wherever. You know, there's not jobs up there in, out in Montana with these huge ranches and stuff. You know, unless you happen to be running a ranch. So like, private islands, all this stuff. They, these are all extremely expensive private jets, uh, extremely expensive options. That, that people who have a lot of money choose to, to take, somewhat for privacy, some for convenience. Um, but for the internet, I mean, it's hard to argue that it will be easier <laughs> to, to remain offline, right? So it's, that means it's probably going to be harder. Um, and to the extent that people who have less money have less time to spend worrying about this kind of stuff, the same way that, that obviously wealthier people tend to worry a lot more about what they're eating, with kale and all this other stuff. To make the analogy to, to the online world, it probably will be the case with people with more leisure, people with more time to be educated about it, will probably um, have a more private online experience. I'm not sure it's the money itself that will drive that. I don't think you're going to have to give Facebook $100 or whatever it is to keep private, although it might come to that. Um, I, think, I think people who have more money will be able to live a more private life online. <laughs>